Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. By the time it was cut short in 1797, the life of the pioneering writer and thinker Mary Wollstonecraft was a gift to the obituarists. She'd escaped a grim upbringing at the hands of a spendthrift and brutal and drunken father and a bleak career as a governess to become a successful writer. She made herself one of the leading intellectuals of her day and knew many of the others, from Thomas Paine to William Godwin, who became her husband. She'd lambasted the political star of the era, Edmund Burke, for his attack on the French Revolution and gone on to write A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, an enduring classic and a founding text of the feminist movement. And she died in the wake of giving birth to the future author of Frankenstein. Given all this, it isn't surprising that Mary Wollstonecraft has become something of an icon. But beyond her dazzling and notorious life story, she was a fine Enlightenment thinker whose work stands comparison with the leading British philosophers of the day. With me to discuss Mary Wollstonecraft are Barbara Taylor, Professor of Modern History in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of East London, John Mullen, Professor of English at University College London, and Karen O'Brien, Professor of English at the University of Warwick. Karen O'Brien, can you give us some idea of Mary Wollstonecraft's early life? Yes, um, she was born in 1759 uh, to quite a wealthy family. Her grandfather had been a prosperous silk weaver in London, uh, and her father, inheriting some of this money, decided that he wanted to move up the social scale, and he bought a series of farms and tried to live a life of gentility. But unfortunately, he was very unsuccessful in these ventures. So Mary Wollstonecraft's childhood experience was one of, essentially, of downward social mobility and instability, um, and as a result, as you mentioned in your introduction, her father became increasingly brutal, uh, drunk and uh, blatantly unfaithful to his wife. So this clearly marked her early sense of what um, a family dominated by a tyrannical father might look like. In addition to that, she was the oldest daughter, but there was an older brother. And very early on, on in her life, she learned that her brother was going to inherit a very large slice of the family fortune and she was to inherit nothing. And I think this deeply shaped her sense of not only of patriarchy, but of fraternity, as it was termed in the French Revolution, the relationships between brothers and sisters, which should, by natural instinct, according to her, be equal, but are in fact unequal. We know her, the story of her father is very graphic, and how she's said to have lain her in, in, slept in front of the door of her mother's bedroom to stop her father getting in, and so on. What about her mother, though? Her mother, um, she treated somewhat unsympathetically in the portrait that she gave of her mother in her earliest novel, but her mother was clearly someone who suffered immensely from the brutality of her father. She was essentially uh, a woman who was, in educational terms, very ill-equipped to deal with the hand that life dealt her, and she became um, indolent, uh, self-absorbed, and really unable to take full charge of her family, so it fell to Mary to look after her sisters and to essentially fill that maternal role and try and protect her mother from her father. Quite early on the idea of have, getting an education, being educated, became very important to her. Where did that come from and how did she pursue it? I think it came initially from that understanding that if she was to do anything in life she would need to be self-reliant and educate herself. Then, um, simply as a way of uh, getting out of the family, she worked for a while as a ladies' companion and then set up a school with her two sisters. It was a way uh, of making a living. But she discovered, I think, in the process that she had quite a vocation as an educationalist. She then... Um, worked for about a year as a governess to a wealthy aristocratic family in Ireland. Again, I think, learning more about education, but also about the differences between education across the social classes. So here was her first experience of uh, aristocratic life and of the kinds of educations that aristocratic young women were expected to have. And all of this bore fruit in her first publication. Her first publication was called Thoughts on the Education of Daughters, which she published in 1787. Uh, and here she set out her views that the contemporary education given to women was superficial, promoted an obsession with appearance, with superficial accomplishments like sewing and singing, and did not equip women for independence of thought, of judgment, and for a life of hardship. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting work because it has a kind of philosophical underpinning, which she derives, I think, from philosophers like Locke, um, which is the notion that the mind can be shaped by education, and also a religious underpinning in the sense that uh, it conveys the notion that life will always be a struggle for men as, for, as well as for women, and education will help you with that struggle. Can I turn to John Mullen and take us on 
<coughs> from there with more discussion about Locke, the effect that Locke had on her. She was a voracious reader of philosophy, political philosophy of her day. These were recent uh, writers. Can you just start with Locke and, and give us some idea of her intellectual um, makeup? Well, I think, as, as Karen's mentioned, I think for, for not just for Wollstonecraft, but actually for lots of... Um, uh, of earnest and genteel 18th century um, men and women. The sort of Lockean idea, uh, which is uh, laid out in his uh, essay concerning human understanding, that that essentially what we have in our heads are made from our experiences, not sort of, uh, we're not formed when we're born, we're actually filled up by our experiences, is a kind of, it's a sort of sine qua known of intellectual discussion. Um, and Locke's ideas are so widely disseminated that it doesn't even require anybody to sit down and read their way through his philosophy. And I think Mary Wollstonecraft was one of the many who takes it for granted, really, that um, because we're formed by our experiences and reason is the capacity that we're given in order to shape and understand those experiences, um, people can be... Uh, uh, changed actually so people are made by their education or their miseducation for instance um, and if you can change the way that people are taught um, or if you can teach people who haven't been taught before then you can make them responsible and rational citizens in the way they haven't been allowed to be in the past Did you believe in the completely clean slate idea? Did you think that nothing came from hereditary, nothing was transferred? Well we have we have God-given reason, um, and that is, as it were, the the the, the divine aspect of us. And that so is, she didn't think that was learned. Reason was gi- reason was given. is something that that we have, but that we can fulfil or not. And uh, um, she is one of of um, of many writers of her particular generation in the late eighteenth century who have a tendency to, to to see that anything that goes wrong in the world not just with individuals, but in society, is in a way to to do with irrationality. And one of the peculiar things, I think, about her, and it's something that happens in the late 18th century to a whole group of, of, um, of thinkers, is that they have a much greater faith in reason than actually some of the great Enlightenment thinkers do. I mean, Locke himself writes brilliantly about how dim the candle of reason is when actually con- compared to the force of conviction, enthusiasm, zealotry, because he's lived through, in the late 17th century, a time of great political upheaval and learnt that men do not always act reasonably. And the great, perhaps the greatest in British Enlightenment thinker, David Hume, was apt to say in, 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 in his philosophy how actually most of the things which motivate men to act do not come from reason. He said it's not, it's not irrational for somebody to prefer the destruction of the world to the scratching of their finger. I mean, it's not a good thing, but it's not an unreasonable thing. Reason doesn't necessarily make our most important decisions. But Wollstonecraft and many of those with whom she shared her values give us extraordinary sort of status to reason. So she forefronted reason, foregrounded reason, and she associated with she associated it with um, with her idea of God. Yes, because when uh, um, after uh, uh, she has worked as a governor, she comes to London to Stoke Newington, which is actually then a village outside London, and um, she tries to start up a what she does. She starts up a school. And she becomes, although she herself has been a, a, a sort of conventional Anglican in the past, she joins in with a circle of what were called at the time rational dissenters, people who apply reason to their religious beliefs. And one of the great influences in, on her is a man called Richard Price, mm-hmm. the leading Unitarian minister in this community. I'll come back to that in a moment, John. Uh, Barbara Taylor, one Enlightenment thinker who was particularly important to her was Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, what did she take from him, positively, and what did she oppose in him? The first uh, mention we have of her reading Rousseau is in the uh, about 1787, when she's working as a governess in Ireland, and she's uh, a young woman full of restless ambition, very unhappy 
um, in the position she finds herself in. And reading Rousseau, she finds him, I think one could say, both simultaneously inspirational and extremely ag- aggravating. I mean, she wrote her first novel, Mary of Fiction, as a direct response to um, Rousseau's great didactic fiction, Emile. Um, and she later directs much of the rights of woman at him. So I think what she what she takes from him in the first instance is she hugely admires him as a social critic. She uh, admires his anti-elitism, his attack on modern manners and what he regards as the corruption and worldliness of modern manners. Um, and she also very much admires his egalitarianism. Uh, it was a huge theme in Rousseau, uh, the ideals of equality, and this is very important to her. She also, uh, Rousseau strove all his life um, for a sort of vision of personal authenticity, and this is something that has enormous appeal to Mary Wollstonecraft, this idea of a self sort of stripped of vanity and pretense. The authentic person rather than the person shaped Ab- by society, yes. Absolutely. And he saw and a distinction, which she saw too. Absolutely. Well, she, she really absorbs that from Rousseau, uh, as many people did at the time. Um, and she identifies with him. I mean, it's not, it's not just a, an intellectual appreciation. There's a real sense of personal identification with his self-presentation as a maverick, a solitary walker, as he describes. In fact, she uses that phrase, applies it to herself at one time. But, of course, she has a problem with Rousseau, which is that... Um, uh, when she reads Emile, she encounters book five of Emile, which is on Sophie or the woman, um, and which is his uh, portrait of the ideal woman. And this is, for her mind, an enormously objectionable portrayal of um, a female ideal as self-abnegating, submissive, governed entirely by the needs and desires of men. And uh, and uh, as she grapples with Rousseau, she decides eventually to respond to this imaging of women um, in, in, in the rights of women. So I think one could say it's a sort of intellectual love affair, in a sense, with a sort of bitter edge to it. Can we take up something that uh, John... Mullen was talking about a few mm. moments ago, and that's her falling in with very most fortunately with these uh, dissenting Christians in uh, in the church still there, beautiful little church on Newington yes. Green, with Price and and also with Joseph Johnson, who ran a review magazine. He invited her in to write for it. These were two massively lucky breaks because she got in effect some sort of university uh, in this place. Dissenters couldn't go to university, of course, and she got an opportunity to write and have her st- stuff in public. Uh, uh, a double, <laughs> huge double break. Can you just tell us more, tell this and more about that group, what they stood for, and and how um, important they were to her? Well, this was, I mean, as you as as you and John have both indicated, an enormously important moment for her. What you have is the Enlightenment pushed to its most radical conclusions with these men and women. Rational dissent, which later becomes known as Unitarianism, is a very humane, rational form of Christianity that believes in the free exercise of reason as the foundation of religious commitment. It's a fiercely anti-superstitious form of belief, uh, denial of the divinity of Christ, um, but an identification of the Christian mission um, as one that, that um, and particularly um, at what they, at the center of the Christian mission being universal benevolence, that is a world built on brotherly love. And in the case of the rational dissenters, particularly Richard Price, Joseph Priestley, another leading revolutionary figure in this at this time who was a rational dissenter, these are uh, great supporters of the democratic revolutions of the age, they, uh, initially of the American Revolution and then of the French Revolution, which they see as a working through of God's intention. Again, picking up something John was talking about, uh, John Mullen was talking about, uh, this fusion, I think you'll fascinate listeners, of her uh, belief in reason and also her commitment to the dissenting form of Christianity is extraordinarily powerful in her and very interesting. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Wollstonecraft... Um, until quite recently, I think, it hasn't been taken seriously as a religious thinker. And in fact, if you look closely at the Vindication of the Rights of Women, um, the um, the aim, really, it, it, the underlying aim of the, of the book is to um, prepare women for a sort of spiritual destiny, to realize their sort of spiritual subjectivity. She takes many of her um, ideas directly from rational dissent, but also from another source, which um, reinforces the religious strand of her work, and that is from sort of Christian Platonist ideals as well. John Mullen, uh, can we talk about her 
which he thought of as rights. Um, 1789, the French Revolution began. How did she articulate her idea of rights in this context? The idea of rights has a very powerful appeal to her and a very arouses some very powerful fears in those against whom she would take up the sort of polemical cudgels because it suggests that we can kind of get behind all the corrupt institutions of a society and, in a sense, remake a political society on the basis, on a sort of intellectual or moral basis. And when the French Revolution happens, what people like her and many other people in England think at first is that when the Bastille is stormed, that what the French are doing is a version of what the English did 100 years before. In 1688, the English had their revolution and got rid of a would-be tyrant in the eyes of people like Mary Wollstonecraft, James, the Roman Catholic James II, and produced what we might now call a sort of constitutional monarchy, although it didn't go very far, it didn't go far enough as far as, uh, as the radicals of the 1790s were concerned. And the French were now doing the same thing. They were going to have a society based on the natural rights of human beings. And indeed, they had a declaration of of natural rights, which uh, uh, thinkers in England took as a kind of model of the sort of template of what a society should be based on. What spurred her to action was a a publication by Edmund Burke, the conservative uh, thinker, philosopher and politician who had been for the American Revolution and wrote a book, uh, an indictment of the French Revolution, basically saying... Societies are held together by traditions and customs to rip it all back and start again and, and make them artificial constructs is a recipe for, yes. for disaster. And she objected to that and fired into action with a very quickly written book, yes. uh, Vindication of the Rights of Men. This is the start of an extraordinary flourishing of pamphlet controversy in the early 1790s. And the key work, as you mentioned, is Burt's Reflections on the Revolution in France. And that actually is itself a response to a published sermon given by the man we've been talking about, Richard Price, who says um, the French Revolution, it's, it's the era of light and liberty fulfilled. So the whole of the Enlightenment is, as it were, being justified in this political flowering. And Burke writes indeed to say that um, um, it's all actually madness, it's going to end very, very badly. I mean, the actual, the force of the reflections is that it's a predictive work whose predictions turned out in the eyes of many to be quite accurate. He said that the, he said in, it, it's, uh, it's been fostered by academics, by people, by intellectuals, by people with ideas, put into practice by lawyers, people with no practical experience of politics, and you know, in the, as he says, in the groves of their academy, at the end of every vista, you see nothing but the gallows. Um, and this became an extraordinarily powerful prediction. And uh, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, before the revolution became violent, grappled indignantly and angrily with it in her vindication of the rights of men. Karen O'Brien, she's come an awful long way, hasn't she, from being a dissatisfied, in fact, almost depressed governess in Ireland to an aristocratic family uh, to writing this pamphlet challenging Burke. She she didn't put her own name to it, but it became known that she, this woman, had stood up and shaken her fist at Burke. And then she went on to write what became her, what remains her most famous work, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, published in 1792. Can you lead us into The Vindication of the Rights of Woman? Yes, she has come an enormously long way because um, the vindication of the rights of men that we've just been talking about is in some ways a kind of diagnosis of false political education in society. What she's saying is that, um, contrary to what Burke has said, people have come to believe in all kinds of strange ways that there's some kind of inherent authority and tradition that hereditary uh, and traditional notions of power, aristocracy, social hierarchy are to be believed. And if we can only re-educate ourselves, we can unbelieve all of those things. And it seemed, <coughs> therefore, excuse me, a logical step uh, to then think about the ways in which women and society in general might uneducate themselves about the ways in which they have traditionally thought about women. And therefore, having written a vindication of the rights of men, she writes a vindication of the rights of woman. 
This vindication, however, is not in a straightforward sense a treatise about rights. It doesn't have a great deal to say about civil rights for women, rights to property, rights within marriage, rights to divorce, that kind of thing. Uh, and it doesn't have a great deal to say about political rights, the right to suffrage, for example. But all of those things are implicit in what she says generally. In other words, if society were reformulated and if women were re-educated, those rights might eventually become a possibility. Uh, so what would you say, to, to reprise it, would the core of her argument in this... The core of the argument is a diagnosis of what she calls the current state of female manners. She uses that word manners a lot. It doesn't mean table manners. It means the kind of cultural milieu in which they exist. And she's writing primarily about middle-class women. She's not writing about either very aristocratic women or about working-class women. Uh, and she's trying to show how women acquire a kind of false subjectivity, a false sense of themselves. So she's using that Rousseauan idea that uh, women in particular accept the ascribed social identities that they're brought up with, and their education reinforces that. And then she's trying to think her way out of those identities. How can women take ownership of themselves? How can they become fully autonomous spiritual and rational beings? How can they be, be educated for a kind of independence that would ultimately allow them to perform a civic role in society? Barbara Turner, what was the effect of this, uh, what is now seen as an extremely important key uh, piece of work? What effect did it have on, on the intellectual society of the day? Did her, did her parish, literally almost, at Newington Green embrace it? And did it go further afield? It was well received. It was well and politely received. I think we, we need to realise that Wollstonecraft was not the first person to put forward some of these arguments. Among educated and thoughtful people in Britain, they had already been exposed, not to such a full um, uh, manifesto for, for, for women's rights, if you like, but to uh, certainly intimations of the argument. So it comes into a world, of, especially around the question of reform of women's education, where people are already primed to think about some of these issues. So there's a, a chatter about it that's largely largely favourable. There's some unease around the degree to which she is seen as querying the sexual distinction, that is, the very notion of sexual difference itself. Perhaps he's pushing the egalitarian argument a bit hard. And there's, so there's some unease around that. Um, and, and some women in particular reading it uh, really enjoy her attack on Rousseau, um, who has irritated them also. Um, I think it's important to see, however, that the reception of the book, the way the book is understood, then changes uh, with the with the uh, changing political climate. John Mullen, was the how much of a general, more general Enlightenment project was the, her attack on female virtues? And it's remarkable. It's not very anti-men, is it? In this book? No, it's not. I mean, a lot of one thing that might surprise the contemporary reader is that a lot of the vindication, given that it seems to be about the consequences of to use her word, tyranny, of domestic tyranny, is about women and how they behave and how they've got to change and get their act together and stop lying around on sofas and um, modelling their aspirations on silly novels. Um, it, it is about how, as she says, women are exalted by their inferiority. So it's a kind of... Um, it's an analysis of femininity and how femininity in an Enlightenment fashion, which she, I think, would say, would ar I'd argue, hasn't really been applied to female manners before. Femininity is made by society. It's not given. So as Barbara said, one of the things that took people aback was her argument that there are no inherently female virtues. That women are put gilded, they're put in little cages, Yes, they, they are. They're and given they're... petticoats and whatever it is, so they can't move very freely. And that, that literally That's right, and they're taught, they're taught this thing called sensibility, a kind of delicacy that they're proud of. They're taught to value beauty more than anything else. I mean, you know, and it's funny that at the other end of the political spectrum, you can find writers like Jane Austen, apparently interested in the same phenomenon at the same time. Her critique of sensibility is that it enslaves women. They are taught it's one of the sort of arts of femininity, and she thinks that this is, this is kind of disastrous for women. It stops them being kind of thinking beings, and it's taught through all sorts of means. It's actually one of the interesting things about um, the vindication is it's absolutely full of quotations, not just from Rousseau, but all the other books that people are reading, which are teaching, which women are reading, which are teaching them to be thoughtless beings. Karen O'Brien, how did you relate love and sexual desire to the idea of reason? Because we have been talking about a pure being so far. She had 
a, a tremendous association with Fuseli. It's not supposed to have been a fully consummated affair, but this libertine, this monstrous man, Fuseli. Uh, <laughs> she had a, um, a, and, and, and wanted to go into a menage a trois with him, uh, him and his wife. She was, in, in, and then we can go and talk later about one or two other things, a passionate woman. How did she bring these two together? Yes, I think, as, you, as you're hinting, this was a period in her life when she was very troubled by her own sexuality, and the whole question of female sensuality and sexuality is handled in a very contradictory way in the vindication. On the one hand, I think what she's trying to say, in essence, is that... Um, uh, there isn't a, a right kind of femininity and a wrong kind of femininity. There's being a human being and there's being socialised into being a woman. And what she's trying to get across is the notion that women should be human beings first and they may be women second, but they may be women for her only when they're in love. This is what she says throughout the vindication, that she'd rather that people were simply in some way uh, non-sexual or asexual, except perhaps when they are genuinely, authentically in love and then they may assume a kind of gendered identity. So she's not ruling out the notion that in certain arenas of life women become women and men become men but she's trying to very severely restrict the arenas in which that is possible because she's trying to uh, say to women that the sorts of power that they have that comes from their attractiveness, their beauty, their sensuality are really false kinds of power and they should only really be exercised in the context of a loving relationship. <laughs> so the vindication has become famous um, and was uh, discussed a great deal in the later 20th century in the context of its apparent denial of female sexuality, its, its ambivalence about sexuality as in some way an obstacle to clear rational thinking. Do you want to take that up? Mom? Discussion about women in the 18th century was almost entirely eroticized or counter-eroticized. I mean, it was almost impossible to talk about women except as sexual beings. And I think we need to remember that when we look at a vindication of the rights of women. I mean, how much Wollstonecraft is trying to set her face against that way of talking about the female condition. So, I mean, certainly there are very open uh, expressions of hostility to what she calls the voluptuous, the voluptuary. So that's fueled on the one hand by the egalitarian impulse in the book, also by her own um, relative inexperience at the time. She is, in fact, we are almost certainly a virgin at the time that she writes this book, and I should add that her views on this do change later. But I think also there's a third thing to remember, which is that there is a very powerful story about love in A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, but it's about the love of God and picking up the sort of platonic strand in her thinking, she sees eros, she sees that aspect of the human psyche as really fundamental to all subjectivities, but the question is the, the direction that it takes and where it leads uh, the per a person in a moral direction, and I think that so that strand is tremendously important and needs to uh, be the context in which we look at her views on physical sexuality. So we're talking about moral duty uh, as well as uh, a theory of rights. But we're not talking, just to emphasise before we move on, Karen, we're not talking about political rights, we're not talking about divorce, we're not talking about legal position, we're not talking about uh, having a vote, we're not talking about women going to university, we're not talking about any of that in Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Not at any great length, but it's, it's hinted at and it's implicit in a lot of what she says. And she takes for granted a notion that rights are God-given and inherent in everyone. Uh, and they're in some way connected with a notion of duty in her writing. And quite a lot of the chapter headings have the word duty in them, duty of parents, duties of people to each other. But I think for Wollstonecraft, the highest duty one has is to oneself as a rational being. And that's actually a divinely imposed duty. And if one fulfills those obligations, um, one uh, other things follow and one is able to exercise one's rights. Right, briefly, because we've got to get to Paris. Well, I mean, I think that, uh, that, that, again, the reader now would find some of her pronouncements on relationships between human beings pretty austere. I mean, she actually says sexual passion should not, in any good relationship, last long. I mean, it should be conquered, actually, and friendship is the word for any good relationship, any good marriage in the long term. And she seems, I think very um, clearly suspicious of uh, the kind of feelings which perhaps in her life often came to sort of dominate him. Barbara Taylor, she went to Paris, Mary Wollstonecraft went to Paris and arrived there in 1792, the revolution's in full swing. What did you find that disturbed her? Well, I think disturbed and excited her. I mean, she plunged um, into activity there. And in 1792, I mean, we're, she arrives on the brink of the... You know, we're moving into, toward the regicide. 
um, declaration of war between Britain and France, the introduction of the terror. She loses friends to the terror. She places herself in a very perilous position by undertaking writing a history of the early stages of the French Revolution, which, had anyone discovered this, um, probably would have found her in the same position as Tom Paine, clapped into prison and possibly awaiting the guillotine. So she has chapters of this sent out. Um, she's in a turmoil. She's gone from Newington Green into the sort of furnace of Europe, hasn't she? Absolutely. She's right at the heart of the revolution. She's hanging out with a group of sort of political um, tourists, if you like, at the White's but Hotel. But in great dangers. We see Tom Paine, who she knew was put in prison and was Absolutely. with an ace of being a, a guillotine himself. Absolutely. Plus, it's worth recalling also that, um, although it's true that a vindication of the rights of woman doesn't dwell on the question of, of rights in its specifics in detail, she has publicly attacked the leadership of the revolution in a vindication of the rights of woman, which is also directed at the failure of the French Revolution to introduce women's rights. So she's come carrying that reputation. The excitement and the turmoil and the boldness, uh, you can see why Godwin talked of her as a sort of a, a hero, heroic figure, yet to her, uh, I should imagine, complete dismay, Edmund Burke, whom she'd attacked, she kept seeing had been right, as John Mullen pointed out earlier, that this was leading to monstrosities, this form of revolution. Yes, and uh, her relationship to the changing character of the revolution is very complex. In fact, she defended the September massacres in the first instance, which might somewhat startle us now, but many people thought, well there will be blood spilled. I mean, you know, this is a world-changing event. However, it's absolutely true that with the terror and with the ascendancy of Robespierre, she becomes deeply, deeply alienated from the direction of the revolution. Although, unlike many English radicals, she never turned her back on the long-term aspirations of the revolution. She's I mean, she developed... Than words with, yeah. Yes, I mean, she de- that's exactly... She develops quite a full and thoughtful critique of the revolution. While this is happening in Paris, John, John Mullen, she's in the middle of all this, she we presumes fall in love, if you can use that phrase of Mary Wollstonecraft, with, with this American chancellor, oh well, <laughs> entrepreneur, if you want, diplomat, whatever, um, Gilbert Imlay, who um, seduces her and gives her a child and then abandons her. Now, can you just tell us about that part of her life and the effect that that part of of her life, had on her life. One of the things about the vindication that we've been talking about is how, although the personal experiences with which we began the programme might have been very much behind it, it often seems a rather impersonal work. What happens in Paris is not just in a sense that her political sympathies are put to a frightening test by the reality of what's happening. It's not just the era of light and reason. Also in her personal entanglement with Imlay, which I think is a deeply passionate relationship for her. I mean, we it, he's sort of talked of as a bit of a sort of rogue and a seducer, but I think it's clear from the, the, the letters that we still have. But for her, this was at least for a time what we might call a, de- a fulfilling relationship. She had discovered love and sexual passion, and because she was a uh, thinking, but also, I think, an, an, an unhypocritical person, this tested her ideas. And after she came back from Paris and after Imlay appeared to have dumped her and have left her with a child, she went on an extraordinary journey on his behalf to to uh, Sweden and Norway to try and get back a ship that he'd lost. And the wonderful, I think, work that she wrote as a consequence of that, a short residence in Sweden, is all about that, in a sense. It's all about the test of your, your personal feelings and the contradictions of your personal actions against your high intellectual ideas. But we're talking about a great wound because she attempted to kill herself after she discovered he'd abandoned her, Karen O'Brien. Uh, how did she get through that uh, that period before she met up with Godwin? Well, it, it did wound her very badly, and that there were two suicide attempts, the second of which featured her jumping into the Thames and being rescued by a, a boatman, so it was a, a serious attempt. Um, she moved back to London, and she resumed some of her activities writing for Joseph Johnson, uh, and it was really through that circle that she came to a period of, of calm in her life, and also, I think, to understand some of the joys of motherhood. She writes very movingly in the letters from Sweden and elsewhere about her genuine and deep affection for her little girl, and she also theorised 
emphasise this motherhood as a kind of female duty and as an arena of, of woman's life that is to be taken seriously. She's in her 30s now. She's in her 30s. She's in her mm. mid to late 30s. And then at one dinner party she meets the famous philosopher William Godwin. Uh, William Godwin was already well known as the author of An Inquiry Concerning Political Justice, published back in 1793. Uh, and he read her Swedish letters and I think partly fell in love with her through reading those letters. And very slowly they became lovers. And then when uh, Mary felt pregnant, they decided that despite Godwin's theoretical objections to marriage as a, as a kind of property, a sort of form of ownership of women by men, that they ought to get married. And they did so, but they continued to live in separate houses. They had met previously, and it's a rather delicious story because um, they met at a dinner party where Godwin was hoping to have a good chat with Tom Paine. And instead, Godwin and Wollstonecraft got into a savage quarrel about Voltaire and religion, which went on the whole evening, and Paine couldn't get a word in edgewise. And Godwin went away from this. This was several years before. Um, really disliking Mary Wollstonecraft. But then, and so he, I think he was quite surprised the next time he met her that he found her so charming and engaging. They formed a union of real intellectual camaraderie as well as sexual passion. Uh, but I think the question of his influence on her, I think it was more the other way, to be honest. Her influence on him is quite obvious in many places. Uh, he actually, I mean, there are revisions in his thought that are, fo that are attributed to her that follow directly, especially around questions of sexuality and marriage and so on, but more generally, taking seriously the emotional dimension of life. And he talks about some of these influences in his biography of her. I think she approached his thought with a certain caution. His communism, I think, probably did have some impact on her. I mean, she already uh, had expressed serious doubts about the rise of commercial society and the impact of differentials of wealth on cultural life and so on. Um, and I think that he probably pushed her further in that sort of, uh, sort of communist utopian direction. John Mullen, how influential as a writer was she then? We're talking about towards the end of the 1790s. She's married to Godwin, live in separate houses. Uh, she's about to have a child who... Um, well, Mary Shelley as a young girl and write Frankenstein. So, but how was she in London? Well, how influential writer was she? The, the vindication was given the fact that in late, a, a bit later after her death, Mary Wollstonecraft was demonised by many. During her own lifetime, a vindication was received with, I think, surprising sort of respect, even amongst kind of those who were not radical sympathisers. And she also lassoed, Karen, she lassoed in the literary, great literary figures by, as what John was talking about earlier, the, the report from Norway which, uh, and Sweden, which people were charmed by. Yes, it was, it was a very successful work. And as John says, until uh, shortly after her death, when Godwin produced this memoir of her, her reputation uh, was, uh, ran reasonably high and she sold quite reasonable numbers of copies of books and they were translated into European languages. It might, might be just worth saying that the, the, the short residence in Sweden, I mean, one of the things about Wollstonecraft, which is important about her is that she is a sort of quite an old formally audacious writer she tries writing in all sorts of different ways and it's written the short residence in letters and she uses the letter form brilliantly to sort of dramatize the conflicts that are going on in her mind and in her life let's talk about this sad ending the sad um, the greater sadness is that she gave birth and a few days later she died um then godwin wrote her biography and was very open about it he's Nowadays, we would read and think, what a tremendously open biography. He writes about this heroic, courageous woman, and it spectacularly backfired. Can you briefly tell us something about Barbara Taylor? He believes in truth-telling at all cost, and he exposes in it her um, affairs, uh, the illegitimate child of Fanny, her suicide attempts, and this uh, horrifies uh, many people, including many erstwhile admirers. Also, however, he publishes with it an unfinished novel, The Wrongs of Woman, or Mariah, uh, which is a very, very different sort of book than Mary had ever published before, much, much more radical in the ideas that it espoused about sexuality, about uh, women's rights, an attack on patriarchal marriage, and at one point an open defense of um, sexual relations outside marriage. And the combination of the revelations of the memoir and the content of this new novel gave people a completely new image of Mary Wollstonecraft and one that um, they really didn't like. Um, Karen, how, how long... Her reputation was blocked by this. People were afraid 
to public to like her public art meant most people were as I understand it and it took decades for her reputation to gather again can you describe how long it took um, it took a great part of the 19th century, although she remained uh, an underground presence and an inspiration to all kinds of feminist movements in the 19th century, socialist feminist movements and others. Not least because, as Barbara mentioned, The Wrongs of Woman, the, the final unfinished novel that she left behind, showed that she was, in her thinking, reaching beyond the social class, which she'd hitherto described, and thinking much more about the lives of really much poorer working-class women. And so I think that, that gave her a kind of purchase and a reach in the 19th century, but uh, it wasn't... A very widespread one. But Virginia Woolf admired her, and by the mid-20th century there was a biography, and it was really in uh, the kind of post-Woolf uh, feminist movement that she became something of an icon. There were biographies, there were editions of her letters, and she became uh, a, a hotly contested and important figure for redefining um, the relationship between the public and the private and sexuality and rationality and some of those issues. Finally, did her work have any influence before the end of the 19th century. Do you want to tackle that, Mama? It, it had influence in um, radical circles, as uh, Karen's already mentioned. She was a real heroine of the early socialists, utopian socialists, and the Chartist movement, pop, radical democratic And in America, in the uh, big and, convention. And likewise in, in America. At uh, the 1850 was, convention, she was brought up yeah, wasn't she? Uh, yes, I mean, from from the beginnings in, I mean, er everywhere there was, everywhere she was known about and acknowledged, uh, and there was unease that surrounded her, except in the most radical circles, until, uh, but with the emergence of um, large scale organized feminism, the suffrage movement, and so on, in the late nineteenth century, she really becomes an icon of feminism. I mean, the suffrage movements, marches in London carried huge banners, Mary. Wollstonecraft, pioneer, so, and she was a real heroine. Well, thank you very much, Barbara Taylor, Karen O'Brien and John Mullen. Uh, next week, Monday to Thursday, in a special series of editions of In Our Time, I'll be telling the story of the oldest national scientific society in the world, the Royal Society, founded 350 years ago in 1660. Its fellows have included Newton, Darwin, Hooke, Boyle, up to Stephen Hawking. That's In Our Time, the Royal Society and British Science, starting next Monday. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this BBC podcast, why not try others such as Start the Week, the Radio 4 discussion programme where Andrew Marr sets the cultural agenda for the next seven days. To find out more, visit bbc.co.uk forward slash podcasts.